All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight here at The Volume. Happy Thursday, everybody. I hope all of you guys have had a great week so far and that you enjoyed your holiday. Today is Golden State Warriors Day. We're just going to take a zoom in on their offseason. We're going to do a recap of all the changes to the roster. We're going to do scouting reports on Trace Jackson Davis and Corey Joseph. And then at the end, I'm going to kind of just tie bow on everything by talking about whether or not I think the Warriors got materially better in the process. You guys know the drill. Before we get started, subscribe to The Volume's YouTube channel so you don't miss any more of our videos. Follow me on Twitter at underscore J. Jason LT, so you guys don't miss any show announcements, and if for whatever reason you guys miss one of these videos and you can't get back over to YouTube to finish, don't forget you can find them wherever you get your podcasts under hoops tonight. All right, so quick recap of the offseason. They drafted Brandon Podziemski. Um, I did a scouting report on him on the day after the draft that you guys can find further back on the feeds. I also broke down his first summer league game the other day. You can find that on the feeds as well. To make a long story short, I think he's going to be a great fit in their offense. He's awesome at advantage creation basketball, attacking closeouts, generating dribble penetration, not with overwhelming speed or quickness, but just with basketball IQ and weaponizing his shot fake and his ability to score in the mid-range. And I also have been really impressed with his passing ability so far as I've been scouting him. Uh, I think he's a big upgrade over Dante DiVincenzo offensively, although I do think he's a downgrade over Dante DiVincenzo on the defensive end of the floor. They also drafted Trace Jackson Davis at the end of the second round. Really interesting player. I enjoyed scouting him this morning. I'm going to do a full breakdown of that here in just a minute. They also traded Jordan Poole for Chris Paul, as you guys know, and they signed Corey Joseph for a veteran minimum contract in addition to re-signing Draymond Green for four years, $100 million. That was something that absolutely had to happen. As I've said so many times on this show, Denver's the exception. Just because they managed to win without a top-tier defensive front line doesn't mean that you can't. They are the exception that proves that rule. As you go back through NBA history, you don't win unless you have a dominant defensive front line. Draymond Green himself has fortified that line four times in his career. He is the 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 one player, him and Steph are the are the players that you cannot give up without losing your championship ceiling. So I thought that was the right move to re-sign Draymond Green. We will do a quick scouting report on Corey Joseph here in a minute as well. All they lost is uh, Dante DiVincenzo for the um, four-year $50 million contract that he signed with the New York Knicks. Just got priced out. There's literally no way the Warriors could have retained him at that number. All right, let's do a quick scout of Trace Jackson Davis. Got a hell of a pedigree. He was Mr. Basketball in Indiana in 2019. He was a McDonald's All-American. He was a two-time Big Ten All-Defense uh, all defense selection. And he was a consensus first team All American last year. His measurements: he's a lefty, six foot eight and a quarter without shoes. That means he'll be like a legit six nine in shoes. He has a seven one wingspan, which makes up for some of his lack of height. And he weighs two hundred forty pounds, so he's not overly thin by any stretch of the imagination. He's also a grown adult. He will turn twenty four this season, so he's two years older. Than Moses Moody, he's three years older than Jonathan Kaminga, and he's been playing grown-up basketball in a winning context for four seasons at a quality program. So you're not getting a kid, you're getting a young man, and I do think that that gives him a much better chance of being a useful rotation player for the Warriors next year. Last season, he averaged 21-11 and 11 on 58% shooting, 2.9 blocks per game. Here's some data from play types on Synergy. He did most of his work out of the post. He ran 375 post-ups and scored 392 points, including passes. That is 1.05 points per possession. There were 70 players in NCAA Division I basketball who logged at least 200 post-ups last year. Trace ranked 16th in points per possession. So he's a very successful, very efficient, high-volume post-up player at that level. He primarily liked to work from the right block and to try to get to his left hand hook over his right shoulder in the lane. He shot 41% on hooks overall, a higher percentage, about 45% when he was going from that right block into the middle of the floor. He also handled double teams really well. He's patient and he makes the kill pass instead of just trying to get rid of the basketball. Now, the Warriors are obviously not going to spam Trace Jackson Davis post-ups, but it gives them a weapon to potentially attack switches. I also thought he demonstrated a lot of good stuff in ISO. He ran 39 ISOs in face-ups that led to 47 points. He does a really nice job when there's a smaller defender on him of protecting the basketball and turning his back. Because again, when you're a bigger player, when you dribble the basketball, the ball's traveling longer to the ground, back up to your hand every time. And so smaller players will swipe down at the basketball. You never want to expose the basketball when you have a size advantage. You want to protect the basketball. So you turn your back and you pivot and you pivot. You get to where you want to go and you take a shot over the top. 
Then when you have a, a slower, bigger defender in front of you, that's when you can expose the basketball and use your quickness because they're not going to be able to attack that dribble pocket as well. Trace does a really nice job of identifying what his advantage is and adjusting his attack accordingly. I actually clipped three examples of Trace working out of isolations and put it on my Twitter feed. So go to at underscore Jason LT and you guys will see some examples of, I, I, I picked a fake spin move that he did that I think will be a really interesting example of what he can do in fake dribble handoff situations to try to get downhill when he's, you know, got Steph Curry or Clay Thompson coming off of a dribble handoff. And then I showed an example of him bullying a smaller player to the basket and him beating a faster, a slower, bigger player to the basket with his quickness with a, dri- a hardcore in and out crossover going back to his right hand. So again, you guys can find those clips on my Twitter feed. Um, Also, in the ISO clips that I watched, he's just a really good passer. Uh, His ability to identify where the defense is warping to him and hit shooters and cutters really impressed me on film. I really think that he has a chance to be a usable role player for this Warriors team. He was also a solid role man. He averaged 1.11 points per possession. Seems kind of low, but if you watch the tape like I did this morning, you'll notice that he just gets absolutely swarmed on all those role man possessions because he's their best player. So it's not like he's rolling into open space the way that he will with the Warriors. He was rolling into a crowd. And when he's with the Warriors, he's going to be rolling into open space. So I'm excited to see him operate there. As uh, In terms of his shooting touch, he's a non-shooter. He was 3 for 14 on jump shots last year, so super low volume, super low percentage, so that's not going to be a factor, at least not yet. Uh, also shot just about just under 70% on free throws, so um, that demonstrates that he doesn't have the greatest touch in the world in terms of future projections as a jump shooter, but you don't need to be a good jump shooter to be a role player big in the NBA. He has no floater. He shot 7 for 24 on floaters on the season. Does have a decent hook shot, though, 41%. So touch is not his strength of his, but I actually do think he dribbles the ball pretty well. So I think with the quality of shots he's going to be getting around the paint and with his ability to dribble and pass, I think he's actually going to be a really successful role man for the Warriors. Now his rim finishing was lower than you would expect. He only shot about 65% there, but it's complicated because he took a lot of really tough shots at the rim out of post-up situations. He was much higher percentage when he was operating as a cutter out of the dunker spot. He was 71% in those situations. That to me is a more realistic representation of where his rim finishing will come with the Warriors. He's not going to be posting up and shooting in traffic. It's going to be him attacking out of the short roll or coming out of the corner as Draymond's rolling down the, 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 the middle of the floor catching and dunking at the basket. He also had 73 dunks last year, which is over two a game. He's really, really springy, has um, uh, the ability to go up out of any footwork and quickly. He's got a good second jump, so I think his athleticism actually makes up for some of his size limitations. Now, on the defensive end, he was two-time all-defense for in the Big Ten his last two years, averaged 2.9 blocks per game, but the reality is, is at 6'8 in the quarter without shoes on, he's probably too small to be like a dominant drop coverage big in the NBA, but I do think he's going to be a successful switching big. There were 18 possessions last year where guys tried to ISO Jackson Davis in uh, in switches, and he only gave up eight points in those situations. Uh, one of Three of those points was a bomb three against Miami in the NCAA tournament that he contested really well, and it just went in. So he defended really well in switches. Honestly, he gets beat off the dribble a lot in those situations, but he does that LeBron thing where he kind of like gets beat but then just recovers and swats you. He has a really good idea of identifying where you're going to shoot from, and then he just sprints to that spot and recovers. Even if it's on the other end of the rim, you'll see plays where he gets beat, And then the guy goes to the reverse and he just comes up on the other side of the rim and smacks it off the glass. He had a bunch of blocks in those situations as well. I think he has the potential to be a plus defender in the NBA, even with his physical tools. So what does that translate to? I think he has real potential to be a rotation big man for them. You know, if you really think about what like a guy like Mason Plumlee can do as a bench big making $5 million a year in the NBA for a team like the Clippers, how big of a gap is there really compared to what someone like Trace Jackson Davis can do in a different context, in more of a switching context, in more of a jumping context instead of like a big size and strength type of context. So I do I do think that he has potential. It's not a guarantee. We'll see how it plays out on the floor, but I do think that that was the ideology that the Warriors were going with. Late second round picks, you're not using any assets. You're not going to have to pay him a ton of money, but hey, throw him out there. He's 24 years old. He's got a lot of basketball experience playing in a winning context. Let's see if he can help us as a bench big. I thought that was a really smart move 
from the Warriors front office. Make sure you guys check out the new Netflix series, Quarterback, coming on July 12th. As Netflix's first partnership with the NFL, Quarterback is a new docu-series that takes a unique look at each season told through the lens of NFL quarterbacks. For the first time ever, the NFL allowed quarterbacks to be mic'd up for every single game of a season. The series features exclusive, unprecedented access to Patrick Mahomes, Kirk Cousins, and Marcus Mariota from the beginning of the 2022 season all the way through to its conclusion, following them on and off the field, inside the huddle with their teammates, and inside their homes with their families. The series features behind-the-scenes footage of the biggest moments of the season. As Patrick Mahomes set an NFL record for total offense on his way to winning the league in Super Bowl MVP awards, as Kirk Cousins engineered the greatest comeback in NFL history and led the Minnesota Vikings to an NFC North division title, and Marcus Mariota taking over as the starting quarterback with the Atlanta Falcons. Quarterback is produced by NFL Films, Omaha Productions, and 2PM Productions. Executive producers include Peyton Manning for o Omaha Productions and Ross Gatover, Pat Kelleher, and Keith Cosro for NFL Films. Again, in this season, you're going to see Patrick and Brittany Mahomes, Kirk and Julie Cousins, and Marcus and Kiyomi Mariota. This is an unprecedented look into one of the toughest jobs in sports coming to Netflix on July 12th. <laughs> I dedicate my life to football. I love to compete. At this point, all that really matters is winning. Why short to cousin right? Clam, two jet rip. Quarterback is more about the mental side. They're gonna come back to you. They're gonna come back six days from now and do it again and again and again. Corey Joseph, he was backup point guard for the Pistons last year, played 62 games, averaged seven points and four assists. Play type data, slightly below average in pick and roll. He's 0.94 points per possession. But you do got to factor in there that he's playing with the Pistons. So he's got a lot of young, unpolished players that he's passing to, which is going to hurt those numbers a little bit. And then obviously the spacing is not great. He did average 1.16 points per possession in spot-up situations, which is excellent. If you zoom in on the shot types, he shot 41% on catch-and-shoot jump shots, 61% when you weight that for threes, 45% on unguarded catch-and-shoot jump shots, which is 68% weighted for threes, and then 35% on pull-up jump shots, 44% weighted for threes. So when it comes to jump shooting and catch-and-shoot situations, he's deadly, and then he's capable in pull-up jump shooting situations. 41% on floaters, that'll be useful. And then he shot 60% at the rim, which is awesome for a small guard. All I look at that as is it adds depth. You basically flipped Jordan Poole and Dante DiVincenzo, two, um, two guards, a lead guard who's pretty inconsistent in Jordan Poole, for Chris Paul, Brandon Podziemski, and Corey Joseph, a much more dependable, at least not necessarily in terms of injury availability, but at least in terms of performance with Chris Paul. And then Brandon Podziemski and Corey Joseph, you got kind of like a veteran option you can go to, and then you've got this... Uh, young player with a lot of upside that you can you know play when he's playing well and sit when he's not playing well and go with someone like Corey Joseph instead. It just gives you more depth for when Steph Curry misses games. So I like the guard core at this point. The, uh, taking a look at the depth chart, the guard core is Steph Curry, Chris Paul, Gor uh, Gary Payton II, Corey Joseph, and Brandon Podziemski. Their forwards, Clay Thompson, Andrew Wiggins, Jonathan Kaminga, and Moses Moody. And their bigs, Draymond Green, Kevon Looney, and Trace Jackson Davis. And maybe they'll sign someone like Dario Saric. As you start to look at the archetypes, it kind of makes a lot of sense. You've got an excellent top-tier point of attack defender in Gary Payton II. You have an excellent wing defender in Andrew Wiggins. Both of those guys are top-tier at their positions. Jonathan Kaminga showed a lot in terms of kind of being like Andrew Wiggins light as an option to throw in perimeter defense situations. Klay Thompson did not have a good playoff run last year, but the year before, he had a lot of moments as a wing defensive player. Obviously, Moses Moody had some moments in the Lakers series as a wing defensive player and as a guy who was making some corner threes. So they fill all of the necessary perimeter defense responsibilities. And then, obviously, in the front court, you can't do much better than Draymond Green and Kevon Looney. They're a championship defensive front court and have done so four times. So, really, to me, it comes down to depth. So, that brings us to our question. Did the Warriors do enough? I think they considerably improved within the postseason context. Why? Because Chris Paul is a massive upgrade over Jordan Poole. He just is. Jordan Poole is super inconsistent. The... Playoff run he had in 2022, obviously it's cemented in stone. He's a champion. But it's it's very uncommon for a young player to play that well on that stage. 
what happened last year is a better representation of what most most young guards do in a playoff setting. Chris Paul, again, as long as he can stay healthy, is going to be a more dependable option there, and he's going to give the Warriors a better chance of maintaining leads with Steph off the floor. Remember, they were like plus 47 with Steph on the floor in last year's playoffs and like minus 49 with him off the floor. So they had a negative point differential because they struggled so much when Steph was off the floor. Chris Paul gives you a better chance to fight in those situations. Also, as you can imagine, in a setting where you have to fall back on pick and roll because Anthony Davis is lingering in the paint and they're they're taking away all of your motion offense stuff, Having Chris Paul as another option to run pick and rolls is an advantage. You can imagine, even with Steph off the floor, a lineup with like Chris Paul, Clay Thompson, and Kevon Looney just setting really hard screens to get Chris Paul open, drawing those multiple defenders, or giving him wide open pull up 15 footers that are generating those closeout opportunities for Clay Thompson. So Clay Thompson doesn't have to constantly attack a set defense at his age when Steph is off the floor. So I do think it improves their ceiling in the postseason context. But. I am still worried about their ability to make it through an 82 uh, an 82 game season without running into similar problems that they ran into last year. If you remember after the season I said they really needed to find a veteran forward that they could slot between Andrew Wiggins and Draymond Green. Why? Because their size ended up being an issue for them on the road in particular last year. They could make up for it fighting with the energy of their home crowd, and they were an elite defense and rebounding team at home, but that fell to pieces when they went on the road. And so having a veteran presence at the forward spot, I thought would have been a better use of the Jordan Poole contract in order to give them a better chance of thriving in the physicality of those environments on the road. Um, That said, that doesn't mean they don't have the same playoff ceiling. It's more of a regular season problem, in my opinion. I do think when push comes to shove, their best lineup is going to be some combination of Draymond Green, Andrew Wiggins, Steph Curry, Clay Thompson. And I don't know if Chris Paul is going to make them too small or not. But at the end of the day, they're going to have the ability and flexibility to potentially trade for that type of player when they get closer to the deadline. Did they add a backup center? No, unless it's Trace Jackson Davis, which means, once again... Like last year, they're in a predicament where the developmental tra- uh, the developmental trajectory of their young players is going to play a huge role in what this team is capable of accomplishing. Because again, if you didn't get that forward to slot between uh, through uh, between Andrew Wiggins and Draymond Green, that means it's got to be Trace Jackson Davis, Moses Moody, Jonathan Kaminga, one of those guys. Are they going to be ready yet? I don't know. And that's going to be the story of this particular season. Because remember, that combination of Older guys that are trying to find opportunities to conserve energy during the 82-game season and younger players that are too inexperienced to consistently play well on the road put them in the predicament where they couldn't win games on the road last year. So what I liked about a veteran forward is it adds depth so that these guys can conserve energy but still have enough and have more consistency compared to the up-and-down nature of young basketball players in the NBA. So again, like, they're, they have been getting a lot of reps. Jonathan Kaminga in particular got a lot of reps last year. Moses Moody got more postseason reps um, in this particular postseason run against the Lakers. And then again, Trace Jackson Davis is older than those guys and has been playing winning basketball for a while. So if one of those guys develops into that piece, then they won't have to make a trade. But once again, they could find themselves in a position where they're hovering around 500 at the deadline and need to make a significant move to upgrade the front line because I'm not sure if they have the depth to make it all work. Now, maybe Dario Saric helps enough there, but I don't think he's athletic enough necessarily to dominate consistently in the physical environments they'll need him to on the road. Um, there's also the Jordan Poole element. How much of their road struggles last year came down to chemistry? You know, um, when you're on the road, you're traveling with your teammates all the time. When you're at home, you go home to your family. And so when you show up to the arena, you're in a better mood. But on the road, it's like you're stuck with your teammates the whole time. And so if there's a chemistry beef, and I don't I don't know the details. I don't know if Jordan Poole and Draymond Green still had issues that late in the season. But I don't know how much – like if Jordan Poole and the relationship with Draymond had an adverse effect on their road situation, getting Jordan Poole out of the situation might help as well with their chemistry and their ability to bring good basketball away from, tra- from Chase Center. So to make a long story short – I think that they're still in a predicament for the regular season and they could end up fighting for playoff position again all season, which could be a problem. But I do think they considerably approved with improved within the postseason context because of the Chris Paul acquisition. And then again, 
push comes to shove, maybe you can flip those young players at this deadline for that particular type of forward that you're looking for. All right, guys, that is all I have for today. Tomorrow, I am traveling to Vegas for Summer League. Don't forget to come say hi while I'm out there. We have shows scheduled for uh, Saturday and Sunday night that we're recording um, uh, at the Blue Wire studio there at the Win in Vegas. Uh, don't forget to come say hi. Like I said, I'll be sitting in the arena watching games for the most part. I also plan on playing some pickup basketball while I'm there too. I'll tweet out uh, the locations that I'm going to. So I hope to see you this weekend. If not, then I'll see you guys on uh, YouTube on Saturday night. Mm-hmm.